past few videos, we've looked at the hydrolyses of, prote of proteins using C-terminal proteases. In this video, we're going to look at the mechanism of an N-terminal protease. Okay, And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to distinguish between the mechanisms of an N-terminal protease and that of a C-terminal protease. Okay, And hopefully also by the end of it, you'll be able to predict which one of the peptide bonds gets cleaved with respect to the alpha carbon. Okay, is it the N-terminal peptide bond or the C-terminal peptide bond? Also, hopefully by now, you're starting to understand the mechanistic steps of a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction. Welcome back to the playlist on proteases. Um, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to take a hypothetical situation and we're going to determine the mechanism of a newly discovered enzyme. And one thing that I will at least mention here, because it's just good for your education, is that um, what I what we what our hypothetical enzyme is is, is it's a duod it's a it's a it's a digestive enzyme that you would find in the duodenum, and the digestive enzymes come from exocrine glands within the pancreas, and so they're secreted into the duodenum upon um, chyme exiting the stomach through the pyloric sphincter. Okay, so they help digest the proteins that are in there. And let's say, for instance, that you isolated an enzyme and you knew that it targeted isoleucine residues. Let's say also it targeted the N-terminal peptide bonds. And so you gave it a little cute name. You called it nisase. So this is where the name comes from, n Ice and isoleucine and ACE, so you call it nisase, and that's because it targets the N terminal peptide bond near isoleucine residues. Okay, so again, we'll use our strategy. Let's find the alpha carbon in question. Well, we see our isoleucine residue, correct? And so it's here's the alpha carbon right here, right? And if it's targeting the N-terminal peptide bond, that means that this bond right here that I'm highlighting, that's the bond that's going to get hydrolyzed and cleaved. Okay. Now, one thing I'll also mention, and we, we did a caspase in the last few videos, and that was a cysteine protease. So what we'll do in this video is we'll change it up, and what we're going to do is a serine protease, just because that's a little bit more common. You'll usually see that... Um, because it's the more common um, type of protease. Okay, There are more important serine proteases than cysteine proteases. Not to say that caspases aren't important, it's just that ordinarily you're usually using serine proteases. Okay, so mechanistically the first step, just like in cysteine proteases, is going to be deprotonation of the nucleophile. In this case, however, notice that it's an oxygen instead of a sulfur. This gives us a clue that it's going to be serine nucleophile instead of cysteine. So the histidine in here deprotonates the uh, the serine residue, and that results in nucleophilic attack and generation of a tetrahedral intermediate. Okay. Now keep in mind also, because this is a serine protease, also remember that we do have another aspartate in the active site that has a negative charge, right? And that aspartate is in an electrostatic interaction with this proton, which if you remember has a partial positive charge. Okay, So that aspartate is able to interact with the histidine, holding it in a certain orientation that allows the deprotonation of the serine. Okay, now we have this tetrahedral intermediate with this alkoxide. Okay, The alkoxide uh, electrons are going to kick back down and just like in the case of the cysteine protease they're going to kick off this amine so the amine these electrons right here are going to come out and abstract this proton from the histidine regenerating the resting state of the histidine now just like in the case of the cysteine protease it also kicks off an amine and we can also make the same argument from the from the c-terminal perspective when we had the c-terminal protease that also kicked off the amine as the leaving group and in any case you are going to kick off the amine as the leaving group okay um, okay so we've generated this tetrahed tetrahedral intermediate we kick off the amine and notice that we get the amine again with the three bonds to it meaning it has a neutral charge what you should remember also is that when you have a nitrogen with three bonds and one lone pair it's neutral so what's going to happen is you're going to have a proton exchange with solution. 
Okay, and so what's going to happen is you're going to get the form of the amine that you would see at physiological pH, and it's going to look like that. Okay, so now we have this intermediate. I didn't mention this in the last video, but it's, there's an important name to this intermediate that we have right here, and that's called an acyl, an acyl intermediate. Okay, an acyl intermediate, and that's a common question that pops up on an exam. So, for instance, this intermediate that's right here, you would term that a tetrahedral intermediate because it has sp3 geometry. However, this intermediate over here has sp2 geometry. It's trigonal planar, and so you call it an acyl intermediate. Okay, And because it's an acyl intermediate, it's primed for another nucleophilic acyl substitution. So at this point, water is going to be allowed into the active site, and the newly regenerated histidine residue is going to perform a proton transfer, and it's going to deprotonate water, in which case these electrons will come out and attack the electrophilic carbon here, generating a second tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, And once we generate that tetrahedral intermediate, um, again, we create an unstable molecule. And the alkoxide electrons will again reform this pi bond, and this time they will kick off the serine residue. And as the serine alkoxide leaves, it will pick up the proton from the histidine, regenerating once again the resting state of the histidine. And here you can you can see the serine residue right here. Okay. Now once again. Just like in the case of the caspase, and we can also make the same argument for the C-terminal enzyme, Okay, we generate a carboxylic acid. So again, we're going to have another proton transfer with the solution. And so what we should get at the end is going to be a carboxylate, not a carboxylic acid. Okay, so once again, let's regroup on this mechanism. Okay, and by the way, all proteases are going to use this mechanism. So in this case, we called it nisase because it targeted isoleucine residues. Um, and you specifically look for the alpha carbon that has the isoleucine. And then you look at the N terminal um, peptide bond just because um, the enzyme has that particular mechanism. It tells us it has that. It's an N-terminal isoleucine protease. Okay. Now the first step is going to be deprotonation of serine, nucleophilic attack, generation of tetrahedral intermediate. The pi bond reforms and kicks off the amine which in this case the amine possess is, is the fragment that possesses the isoleucine, which quickly does a proton transfer for water to generate the amine that we're used to seeing at physiological pH. Okay? Now we have an acyl enzyme intermediate, okay? and the histidine, which is newly reformed in the deprotonated state, deprotonates water, and effectively the hydroxide attacks the acyl intermediate carbonyl carbon, generating a second tetrahedral intermediate. Again, the pi bond reforms, kicking off serine as it abstracts a proton from histidine. And again, we generate a carboxylic acid, which undergoes another proton exchange with solution. Um, so at this point, now what you've seen is you've seen both cysteine proteases and serine proteases. And likewise, you've also seen serine nucleophiles and cysteine nucleophiles. And once again, if you did want to change this into a cysteine protease, all you have to do is replace this atom with sulfur and carry that through the rest of the mechanism. Okay. If you if you haven't seen the other videos that are on this, this should be the third video in the playlist on proteases. Go back and watch the other videos. It should give you a little more intuition. This enzyme is not one that exists, but it's just a hypothetical example. Okay. So I hope this video gave you a little bit more intuition on proteases. See you in the next video. What we're going to do in the next video is we're going to go over a new type of enzyme called a lipase. See you in the next video.